Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on how leaders can manage crisis. And I would now like to introduce Dr. Ricardo Vienna Vargas. Dr. Vargas is the executive director of the Brightline Initiative. Over the past 20 years, he has been responsible for more than 80 major transformation projects in several countries, covering an investment portfolio of over 20 billion U.S. dollars. He was the first global director of the Infrastructure and Project Management Group with the United Nations Office for Project Services, UN Ops. He has written 15 books on the subject of project management. He hosts one of the most relevant podcasts in the field, Five Minutes Project Management Podcast, with more than 4 million views. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to you. Thank you, thank you, Alex. Hello, everyone, and uh, I hope I find all of you well and safe. I know it's uh, very challenging in different times, and we decided to talk about one of the researches um, we did uh, at Brightline together with uh, Quartz, and we went because it became so, I would say, so timely what we discuss about how we can learn and how we can transform um, with the crisis, this crisis mode. So I want to share this uh, with you as part of our advocacy program. So what you can see uh, behind that my, my slide deck, uh, it's uh, an image of a virus. Uh, of course, I was thinking about starting putting the COVID-19, uh, COVID uh, virus uh, in the back, but this is not COVID. And this was the virus that generated the idea of doing this research one and a half years ago. This is the Ebola virus. And my history goes back to 2015. And when Ebola is striking uh, Western Africa, and it was uh, really one of the most deadly um, diseases that we had in our time. I'm not talking about COVID now. One thing that happened last year is that we had a meeting with Bristol Myers Cube. Bristol Myers Cube is one of the coalition members of Brightline that is led by PMI. And we were discussing, and he said, Dave Marlowe said to us one thing. He said, why when we face a massive crisis like in Ebola, silos were broken, people shift priorities, almost immediately and what we can learn from that and this is so absolutely timely because i want that each of you that is watching this webinar think about yourself and your priorities just six weeks ago and now including myself so i'm in lockdown and probably i would say if not all of you 99% of you are staying home for a long time. It's a big shift, a big impact on economy, movements, trade, everything. And yesterday on, on my bed, I was taking, and, and I, I, I like very much reading The Economist, I was taking this magazine, The, uh, the World in 2020, and I read it. And there was, and this is an absolutely outstanding source of information. Nothing about a potential pandemic. And we are now in the end of March. And the world is just in shutdown mode because of a crisis. So people stop going in the streets. So what is that and what we can learn from that? So the first thing we need to understand that crisis is not a normal changing process. No, crisis is a critical event or point which if not handled in an appropriate and timely manner, or if you do not handle it at all, may turn into a disaster or a catastrophe. So today, while I speak here, we are in the middle of probably, if you are less than 80, 85 years old, this is absolutely the most impactful crisis. I never saw, I'm, I'm talking from, I'm Brazilian, but I live in Portugal. There is absolutely no single person on the streets. I'm in my house for 17 days in a row with my family. 
So I never, I don't recall in my life something with such a dramatic impact on business and economy. Imagine if you are running a large automotive industry, you probably shut down. Imagine that you, if you were a tiny restaurant, you are closed. And this is such a massive crisis that is not a crisis in one specific country. Well, this morning I read that around a third of the population is in lockdown. So imagine the impact of that. So what is happening now is that everybody is thinking on two basic aspects. What do we need to do now immediately to stop, I would say, this bleeding to people, stop dying and to get past this pandemic. This is the first one. The second one that every single person is thinking is what is next? How life would be after all of this is over? We will go back to exactly how we were in December or it will be completely different. And this, the second moment, is where I want to talk more to you about that. I'm not talking about you should stay home, you should wash your hands. But I'm talking, okay, when this is over, what can we learn and how we can improve in order to be in a better position as a society for a potential next crisis that may happen in the future. So this is exactly what we decide to do. So when we created this, we, we basically started with a simple question. How to transform an organization using the learning from a crisis situation? Right now, all of you, if you are an entrepreneur, if you are a consultant, if you are a teacher, you are thinking, okay, how I can prepare myself if in the future something similar or something massively critical happens. How should I behave? For example, right now, I'm taking a lot of cautious when I move the slides because all the internet bandwidth is overloaded with people working remotely. So imagine the adoption of remote work. I need to tell you, for most of the population globally, they are facing their first experience of buying grocery online. Trust me, maybe it's not the public that is hearing uh, this webinar, but I'm talking the society in general. People that used to go to supermarkets, they cannot go anymore and they need. So all web delivery and all, all deliveries are overloaded. So we are facing such a massive transformation in the way we do business. And what we can learn from that situation. So on all this big shift from a daily to day. So if we if we see the world one week ago and we see now, we see such a massive difference. So what we decided to do, we joined a force with Quartz and we create, and this report is available to you, all of you. And I want to share with you on the, the next minutes a little bit of the findings of this. So this report, you can download and understand what we can learn from this mode that we can benefit. Not, I'm not talking, please, just about making your business better. No, no, it's above and beyond that. It's how we can make a society more resilient. And this is one of the key aspects. I, I just, I didn't have time to put this on this slide back. But this morning, I was thinking about that. So take a look on this. I, I, I'm sorry for my poor drawing. But did you see that this flow and this disruption and this flow? So this is a basic concept I want you to get out of this webinar with. So look, this is improvement over time. So you improve society over time. At this point, you have a crisis. It can be a crisis like COVID-19, but it can be like a dramatic uh, accident or like something very impactful, like a hurricane or an earthquake that brings you down. 
So what happens when you go down and we are exactly on this moment? You can go down and never recover. You can go down and just make a parallel here and you lost that moment. Or you can do something like that. Did you see that the inclination is different? This is what we are calling resilience. When you, your next weight, you become more strong and more agile and nimble to progress. This is exactly what we want to share with you today. And, and this is not just Ricardo's opinion. We worked with 1,200 people and we did 18 expert interviews from all over the world. We tried to cover as much as we can, trying to understand half of them in a decision position, so a C-level position. And I want to share with you some of their findings. The first thing is that everybody asked me now, saying, Ricardo, when everything becomes normal, will the restaurant be the same? Or will the hotel industry or tourism industry be the same? 93% of them agreed that. When they face a crisis like the one we are having now, they change the way they operate in the future. So the Ricardo that is talking to you now will be changed by this event. And will change, I will change the way I think about my business, my job, the work at Brightline, because this is exactly what we can benefit from the crisis. So everybody is thinking now how such a tiny virus that in the first moment, in the very first moment, seems okay, it's like a cold. Just shut down the world. Right now, if I'm not wrong, 35,000 deaths growing exponentially every day. Everybody's thinking how on earth with all the evolution of the society, we could not protect ourselves against that. This is exactly what we are talking. So every single company, every single of you that are listening to me, you will change the way you operate. No matter what is your business, no matter if you work in a factory, no matter if you work in a hotel, if you are a software developer, if you are a project manager, or if you are a consultant, you will be impacted. You will need to identify new ways of working. And this is a critical point. And I want to share with you four findings, and I will try to relate them with the current crisis with COVID. The first one, every time you face a crisis, you shift completely your focus. So go back to your own life in January and think what were your priorities about your personal development, about your business, and look now. Suddenly, everything that seems to be extremely important for you at that time became just irrelevant. So imagine those who have parent, uh, family members, relatives that got sick. So, or imagine those who elderly people around or living together. Imagine that your priority just shifted. Your company that used to have a lot of plans, let's do this, let's do that. And suddenly you have to just shut down, shut down completely. Some of them with a more dramatic and impactful, but every single one. So what happened is that you nail down your focus in a dramatic and fast paced way. Suddenly, suddenly, for example, if you work in a pharmaceutical industry, you don't care about what will be the new medicine for to help you to lose weight. Because this at this moment became just irrelevant. So you see auto manufacturing starting to produce ventilators. So there is a massive shift on what really matter now. So look how different and, and why this? Because the crisis makes you move to sharpen your focus in, in an extremely fast-paced way. So take a look 
75% of the people we interview reported that this crisis make them stronger on implementing things. So let, let me tell you, I, I don't want, please don't, don't take me wrong, but what I truly hope is that with all this moment and this challenge, that we leave that crisis much stronger than we are right now. Right? This is one of the key things we must understand. Because we need to understand that this moment will make us more resilient than going back to that chart I just showed you. And look, 91% changed what is their priority. And I need to tell with this COVID that is, well, I would say it's not even 91, it should be 99.9. .9. Every single one of you that are listening to this webinar are refocusing your priorities on what is really important to you. And you did this at the lightning speed. It didn't take you a one year of strategic planning. It didn't take you two years of trying to do scenario planning. It's adapt to survive and continue moving. And this is a very absolutely critical point. The second critical point is the need for speed. Uh, of course, uh, I would, uh, I would use, uh, I would say, a space shuttle or something like that. I put a plane just to. It's speed today is absolutely critical. So when you are on the crisis mode, you don't think on years. You don't think about what would be my strategic vision for 2050, because it, it's just impossible. Let me tell you, we are all sitting in our offices, in our home, trying to figure out when the isolation will come to an end. Let me tell you, if you watch 25 different newspapers, you will hear 25 different projections. Maybe it will be in two weeks, maybe it will be in six months. I heard now uh, uh, in, in a UK uh, newspaper talking about six months. So look, the, the need for speed now, it's absolutely critical. So what we learned, I want to share two graphics. The first one is 91% increase in their decision-making process because you need to decide now. Let, let me tell you. Today, for example, when we think about government decisions, company decisions, corporate decisions, travel decisions, one day means 20% more cases or 20% less cases. And of course, I cannot forget this uh, here. So this chart I, I built uh, during this weekend. So I take the Imperial College COVID-19 response team. They have an amazing paper talking about the projection and they use big data and they use all the analytics in South Korea, China, and all the places to, to model how isolation will benefit or not. But what you can see on these charts, on all of them, from the steepest one to the, the flattest one, you see that the growth change. Look, April 20 to May 20. We are talking about z from zero to 100 in one month. So, for example, if you're to say, I'm not here, I'm not an expert in public health, but if the right decision is to isolate people and you delay this decision by one week, the price can be dozens of thousands of deaths. So I was reading today in, in the news talking that if, for example, Brazil does not take care and isolate people, it can be a million deaths. So this is exactly the urgency. And this is what us are trying to figure out first in the in, in a bigger scale from governments, but also in your organizations, because everything, the impact is dramatic. Imagine three weeks ago, 
all restaurants in the planet, maybe except in China, were open. And suddenly, in a, in a matter of a couple of days, everything was shut down. We start people and this. So the impact and the decision making must be extremely fast. So this is what the crisis, this sense of acute urgency. Third aspect, and this is absolute, this is not just a, a fancy chart. Power of people. What we can learn from that. How you seen that you knew many new colleagues on your TV or your, your social media that just came up as a rising talent. Because traditionally, what do you expect? Is that the senior leaders in organizations, they will guide us through the crisis. Yes, but most of the time you had different new talents just coming up from different sides, sides and most of them unexpected ones, unexpected ones. So take a look on that. So 93% of high performing organizations. They believe crisis, undercover talented leaders. So this is why you see, for example, uh, an advisor on public health becomes more powerful than the president. So a rising talent, these, these anonymous volunteers, these anonymous health workers, they become, they, they show their talent on this crisis environment. I want just to use an example. Two days ago, the prime minister of UK asked for volunteers. He said, we beg to have volunteers helping us to handle the situation. And he said, we need a lot of them. And I believe he said something like 200,000 volunteers. He got 400,000 people volunteer so these these talents that come from nowhere the volunteers that are just passionate about helping you to guide through that so this is a very clear example and this drives me to one one moment that was one of the most interesting moments of my professional life uh this was 2014 to 15 uh during the Ebola crisis in sierra leone liberia and of course, uh, I don't know if you recall, every single person was trying to leave that area. So planes, they were basically in lockdown when nobody wants to stay there because Ebola uh, is not as contagious as COVID, coronavirus, but it's much more deadly. So nobody wanted to be there. And then we were, I was at the time at the United Nations and we were moving on the opposite way. And we did a volunteer call in, uh, at UNOBS. And we said, who is willing to go to these places to help, to figure out how we can help that society? In 24 hours, we got more than 100 volunteers, almost immediately. So did you see how this, in, in this crisis, this creativity and this uncovered talent? So we will have, a lot of new talents coming up from our organizations with creative ideas, creative ways of doing things and positive message, optimism, because what is very easy now is to get depressed. So these new talents will fulfill this new dynamic. And if you are able to keep that mindset, you can drive things better. And also 75% of the modifications you create to respond to the crisis remain in place. Do you see that most of the time when you are in crisis, you need to create, I'm, I'm using this current one, policy working from home, approval, access to corporate systems from home, right? So things that usually, I, I want to use a perfect example, university, using tests from doing tests from home 
this was a big challenge in traditional universities because tests should be very well protected. So right now, at the lightning speed, most of universities in the US and worldwide are starting to say, look, I have no option. People need to stay home and we need to move. So things that would take 10 years to develop online education is taking, what, five weeks, maybe six weeks. So this is a very important, so many process you are changing today to survive during this turbulence will become your new ways of operation. Many restaurants are opening caterings and implementing caterings or takeaways. Most of the time, these will become a permanent problem for them after the crisis is over. So delivery, all these new kinds of supply chain. So people will start to be much more uh, smart and nimble in terms of getting the benefits from the crisis. Let me tell you, even on, I, I was reading a book called Tiny Habits uh, from uh, B.G. Fogg, and, and I, I was just, remember, I will never go back to wash my hands the way I used to wash eight weeks ago. Because, you know, I'm washing my hands some like 20 times a day. So I'm getting so used to, you know, stay half a minute washing my hands, that this will become a habit that I will get. This is just a very simple example to all of you. And last but not least, the committing to communication. And let me explain why this is so critical. Did you see the overload of fake news or people trying to benefit from the crisis in a non-ethical way. So every single day, I hear and all of you uh, hear hundreds of medicines that will save you from coronavirus, that taking this vitamin will protect you, that you should drink more water, uh, everything, all different versions. And what you need to understand that communication becomes absolutely critical for you to avoid all this wave of gossip and fake news. Let, let me tell you, I, I studied a lot communication. Why gossip and fake news spread? Because most of the time, the true source of information is not there. So imagine that your company has a crisis, but nobody talks about it. Nobody talks, nobody, it's something like a secret. What happens? The grapevine propagates a news that nobody can control. So what is absolutely important today, and if you go back to the recent article from Yuval Noah Harari at the Financial Times, he said exactly that. If countries and the society in general decide to have open, frank communication, and help each other, the chances that we have to overcome this challenge is far bigger because it's not a, it's not a problem anymore of US, UK, or Brazil, or, or China. No, no, it's now it's a problem from the wealthy people, the poor people, the people with jobs, people with no job. So committing to communication. So take a look on that. So what we, we saw on this, on this report, 71%, that agree on understanding what the priorities are, renew the sense of direction. So right now, even before you talk about productivity, you need to sort out what you will do with the crisis. And this mindset of open, transparent, collaborative communication, it's something that must survive the crisis. This is exactly what we aim, and this is exactly what we learn. So now I'm going back to what I said to you uh, uh, in 2018 when we decided to do, and we used the example uh, of Ebola. He, he said, Dave from BMS said to me, Ricardo, we start to collaborate with other pharmaceutical industries 
that used to be seen as a competitors. Groups that were isolated in silos inside organizations, they broke their, that silos and start working together like magic in a matter of hours. While I'm talking to you now, these silos are being broken everywhere to find ways of supplying things, finding ways of getting to that, producing facial masks, whatever. So this is exactly the kind of collaboration and renewed sense of priority. But this is only possible when you communicate. And, and one thing, I'm, I'm close to my, my end, but one thing that is very important that we mentioned, not, no crisis is the same. So it's not, please forget that mentality and say, oh, this crisis is a health crisis related to the respiratory system. So we will produce a vast amount of ventilators. And if something like that happens, we'll have and we'll be prepared. This is not the way we solve the problem. Because maybe, I'm, I'm just using the same analogy, maybe the next pandemic will be, I don't know, skin related, or maybe hair related, or maybe brain related, or maybe diarrhea not necessarily the same. So what is important is that we need as a collective group to learn new things and put this experience in our bag and become more agile and adaptive, adaptive. I, I did a post recently on LinkedIn and, and one person asked me, what would be your main, uh, main uh, learning from all of that? Is you must become agile, nimble, and adaptive. This is what makes you survive. I'm, I'm not survive as an individual, but your company is the ability of your company to reinvent the business, reinvent the business model, understand in a fast and, and flexible way. And this is what is very important. And this is why we have a challenge because not a single crisis is equal. So uh, a lot of people and, and heads of state said about, oh, we live in a crisis, uh, it's like a war. No, it's not a, a war because we have an enemy that has does not care about borders, does not care about anything. And we don't even know where this enemy is. So it's a different, maybe in, in the future, we'll have a different kind of crisis, but it's very important that we need to take the benefit. And, and of course, probably all of you or most of you, you saw the TED talk with Bill Gates of 2015 talking about what we could learn from Ebola to avoid a new pandemic. And, and what is, is very sad sometimes is that we miss the opportunity of learning with such a painful process. We need to get the best chance to leave this crisis in a better position for our organizations and our society in general. Because right now is not the time to blame, but it's time to really innovate. So we did that. And with that, I, I really want to offer you to, to download this report. Of course, I, I didn't explain. There's a lot of other data that you can get to that. There's a lot of appendix that you can go through. But, but what I really uh, want to finish my, my talk is that despite of we perceiving only the bad side and, and looking, we need to come out of that as a better society, a better company, you know, and this is what really matters because a lot of uh, the price we'll pay is extremely dramatic. So we need to take out the good things of it to make us a better society. So that's it. Thank you, really. I really enjoy to be with you. I thank Alex. And now let's move to some of the questions you may ask to me. And joining me with the questions, I will invite the Director of Operations, Taidua Sun, uh, that will help me uh, trying to answer and trying to address your questions. Thank you. Alex. Hey, morning, on. <laughs> Hello. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Vargas. And we're now going to begin answering questions submitted during today's presentation. Okay. 
So first up, we have a question from uh, Abhe. So how do we get clarity around priorities during a crisis? Yeah, I will. I will start, and, and Tyro may may uh, may continue. The the first thing you need to understand it's you need to do an immediate impact analysis. So what I would suggest to you is take your plan and your direction six weeks ago. Take a look on it and say, now with this, what will be dramatically impacted? What will be impacted? And what I can continue pretty much doing the same because the impact will be zero or very low. And then immediately after doing that, you would say, okay, this that would be dramatically impacted. Can I do something actively? Can I reshift the, the scope? Can I change or, or find a detour or another path to get to the same outcome? I'm not talking about output. Can I implement that? Yes or no. If it's a no, then you need to say, by not doing that, what will be the impact. So immediately you need to understand, okay, if this was dramatically impact and it's a top priority, the only chance you have is to find another way to get to that. So I'm a restaurant. I'm just using, and I'm impacted because I cannot have guests. So how do I prioritize income and revenue to my restaurant? Suddenly I, I can say, can I shift to a takeaway? Can I use social media to advertise that I have takeaway? Can I improve phone answers and can I improve the website to do that so I can keep the minimum revenue? These will become your priority. So this, or maybe if you are a restaurant, but you are not very concerned about revenue because you have enough funds to survive, then maybe you will say, so now I need to keep my supplier. So what kind of activity? So it's it's rethinking your priority. And of course, uh, one thing that is very important, there is no way that you will find a solution that is perfect. Remember, in a crisis mode, you are talking about what is less dramatically impactful. I would love to be walking on the streets, but I need to understand what is the benefit of going out and staying home because every single one will be impacted. Otherwise, it's not a crisis, it's just a normal process. Tyru, I don't know if you want to step in. Thank, thank you so much, Ricardo, and thank you all for joining us despite uh, this uh, challenging uh, moment. Uh, I'm calling you from Ottawa, Canada. And uh, of course, when we are in this period, as Ricardo was mentioning, we'll see people coming out. And I want to maybe pause a little bit to thank all the people on the front line, let's say the nurses, the doctors, and everybody on the front line that, despite the challenge, are coming out and helping out and helping us getting out of uh, the crisis. I want to answer that question regarding priority to say the first thing really, as you think about the priority, is accepting that there is a problem, not going into denial. Because if you are in denial, what will happen would be basically a tendency to try to continue things as they are. And things are not as they are. The situation has, has changed. Once you accept that there is a change and there is a need to act, then many things can unleash. In terms of priority, maybe you have 10 different things that are ongoing, but all of a sudden you can look at them and see which one is absolutely critical and basically reduce into this. The second one is about not necessarily starting new things, but if you were to start something new, it has to be something that helps you actually address the challenges that you're facing. In the nice example that Ricardo just gave, starting something online, that could be something that will help, let's say, the restaurant in the crisis. So during this period, it will be very prudent to not start many new things, but starting those that are also helping you addressing the crisis and stopping those that are not necessarily critical. And then when you have that sense of focus on the limited actions, you will have a better chance 
of also earning the trust of the people within your organization. Because if you're in the class and you start all many new things, or maybe you're keeping things that are not seen as important, your people will be having a doubt. Is our leader having a sense of what is important and what is not important? So basically, that needs to go back to what is priority and only starting with key things that will be useful are very important. And one thing that I will add here on the notion of priority, sometimes as a leader, as you're making these decisions, based on the information that you have, people may be doubting them. Is it, is it too extreme? Maybe people may not believe that, but sometimes after, as things are unfolding, that when people will say that, yes, this was the right decision. And I'll give a quick example within PMI. Maybe a, a month and a half ago, a decision was made to stop travels. Let's say, let's say in Europe, for example, you cannot go to one other, another country. Or in North America, you are only limited to, to, to Canada and uh, the US. When that decision was made, many people could have seen that it was extreme. Why I cannot move? Why I cannot move from, let's say, Portugal to Spain? But now, when people look back, people say, yes, this was the right decision. And what I want to say is, as a leader, you will be facing with challenges in terms of making a decision that people might not necessarily see as needed at that time, but actually it, needs, it is needed and you need to act on it. Yeah, uh, Tairu, Tairu said, and absolutely perfect. Thank you for doing that. PMI leadership. So it's it's a really I'm not I'm not talking because Brightline is part of PMI, but PMI leadership took bold decisions when PMI before almost everybody, so like three days before everybody said stop travel. And then I was this example, Tairu, Tairu didn't mention, but it was my example because I was supposed to talk in Spain and I live in Portugal. And I said, oh God, it's it's so close. It's 45, 40 minutes. You know, and then I heard that the person that would do the keynote with me, the opening keynote, the former minister of, of health, I think in 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 Spain was contaminated with COVID. So look, look how crazy. So sometimes you need to take both decisions uh, to make things uh, happen. And this is not easy, okay? Because if you do it wrong, uh, people will blame on you. But, but this is what leadership is about, okay? Alex, the next question. Excellent. So we have a question here from Vivek. Crisis often brings chaos. How do we bring clarity amidst this chaos? faster and clearer. Yeah, uh, look, um, I cannot agree more because it's uh, the crisis shake everything in a dramatic way. So I can give you my advice. My advice is quickly, quickly communicate the assumptions you are working with. So for example, you are a company and you, you want to do a briefing with your employees. The first thing you need to say and say, look, our crisis area, we believe that this crisis will last two months, that these areas will be more impacted, that the, you, you are working with assumptions. Remember, every single assumption, you don't have control. Every assumption comes with a risk. Okay. But at this time, you need to have some assumptions. You need to have something you believe on to bring clarity to the clouds. Imagine you inviting your employees and say, look, everybody will work from home. Until when? Oh, we don't know. It can be a week or it can be a year. This does not help. But what you need to say, you need to bring clarity using clear assumptions. So you create and say, look, we believe that in two weeks, we have more clarity about how the, the pandemic is moving. So we are assuming that nothing will happen in two weeks and everybody will stay home. In two weeks, we will revisit that decision, extend it or change it. So you are bringing clarity by using acceptance. Second, you bring clarity by communicating often and in a reliable way. Way. So you need to create 
in, in your company, in your internet, a COVID-19 area where you talk or maybe external, you are bringing clarity to people. So are you open? Are you operating in half of your capacity? You reduce the chaos by using these assumptions. And all the time, you need to reinforce that these assumptions may change. Because let's suppose that to, tonight we go to bed and someone discover a vaccine or a treatment that resolve the problem of COVID in a matter of hours. It can change everything. So bring proper communication and use the right assumptions to that. Tyro, do you want to add to that? I, I will add two more points, Ricardo. Thank you. I mean, of course, in addition to communication, one thing that I will say when you're making these assumptions is basically not be definitive. Because in today's crisis, if you go out and you say it will be over in two weeks, or maybe by the time we get to Easter, we may be able to open things or we'll open things. If you make this definitive statement, and we don't necessarily have the entire picture, and we don't know how things will evolve, all of a sudden you may lose the trust that you're building. So despite if, if the chaos is there, but as long as you are clear, and as long as you let people know, it should be better. The second thing is, as we were mentioning earlier, one thing that we found very important out of the research is the empowerment. So basically giving power to people. That, that, that means that, of course, there are many people not knowing what to do. And if people need to wait to get a central decision and approve all the approval layers that are required, things won't move. And if anything, the chaos doesn't become better. So as you delegate more and you let people be, uh, empower people to make the decisions, of course, they'll try. And then if the right thing, it's moved faster. But if they are very lethargic, not moving, and not taking any action, the chaos could be even more, or it could last even longer. This is the Absolutely. other thing that I will add. Alex, back to you. Yeah, so here we have a question from Adrian. How do we convince top management of implementing an agile process for this crisis? Yeah, uh, Adrian, uh, I don't think it's, it's just a matter of implementing an agile process here. It's a change in behavior. Uh, the problem is that leadership in the organizations must understand at this time, I'm using this crisis, the current crisis as an example, what is priority? And the organization must be very, very strong on telling people what is their priority. So for example, for example, I'm using many organizations. They said, look, right now, our priority is not necessarily make more profit. So we will tell shareholders our priority is to protect your, our employees and help our society to get out of this. So you can see this in several organizations. And I'm talking, this must be true because the worst thing you can do, leadership can do now is to lie. Let me tell you, because if you lie now, the impact on your organization and your society will be so dramatic that is most of the time unrecoverable. And how do you convince? So you need to take bold actions towards that. And I'm not saying as an employee, but we need to engage shareholders, owners, board of directors, clients, customers. Let, let me tell you, today as a customer, I, I need to tell you, I don't buy from a company that is irresponsible now. If a company say, I don't care about people staying home, I want to put all my employees work, I don't buy. If a restaurant opens now normally, thinking that there is nothing happening, they lost a client because I will not buy. And this is the way because now when you are facing a crisis, there is something, there is something there, that is a layer above everything. There is a layer above uh, profit. There is a layer above uh, money. So this is what is really important. This society plays a massive role on a massive role, the way we behave, because it's impossible to check everything. So this is the way we convince management. Because right now, if someone is trying to make profit out of uh, uh, this tragedy, this human tragedy, 
it's something that is just unacceptable. So this is the way we manage people and we convince people to do that. And I need to tell you, on that side, I can see extremely good examples that we can be inspired for. Companies that are uh, 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 beer companies that are starting to produce uh, alcohol uh, to clean, um, uh, manufacturing of clothes starting to build uh, masks. So these are the, the kind of movements that the society is playing a role now. Tyro? Thank you, Ricardo. I'll just add one, uh, two, two more points here. Of course, during this crisis, there is also the learning that one can share, because how do you convince management as well? One way of going about it is about sharing good practices that others have used. And this was the very intent of the report that we released uh, last year on the crisis. Basically, we were looking at, during crisis, what were organizations doing? And being agile, basically speeding decision-making, I mean, the notion of focusing, not looking at too many things at the same time, all these communication and power to people, all these were uncovered as part of that research. So one can share the learnings of the, the research. That's one thing. The second thing that, that we know also is, of course, right now, uh, many, many organizations in the past are doing things that they wouldn't consider. So the crisis is creating that necessity to add it, to act differently. The good news is, after the crisis, some of the things that we are adopting now uh, would stay. So let's say working from home, some organization might have never considered it. But yeah. today, if you move after the crisis, because we've been after the crisis, people will be more willing to consider this. One thing that I saw personally changing a lot is the event industry. In the past, of course, we have, a, I mean, on-site events, that's the standard. And then you have few online events. But all of a sudden, I saw a massive shift where many organizations are hosting online events and they're finding ways of making it useful. And then, of course, adapting to the context. So agility is also sometimes driven by the necessity. And the good news is, after the crisis, it will continue in many cases. Yeah. Alex? Yeah, so a relevant question here. How do we understand which changes should be considered as permanent ones after the crisis? Uh, yeah, um, Adler, thanks for your your question. Uh, I could see it here. Um, look, it, it's not it's not very easy to say oh that change will become permanent or not, but it's much more a trial and error. Right now, you are on the emergency state, so you cut you you make some. Uh, cutbacks here and there. Some of them, they will say, oh God, this can be very helpful for us in the future. And those are the changes that will stay. Some of them are very obvious. For example, we are talking now about this crisis. The concept of working from home, oh my friend, th there is no chance it will stay. Of course, I'm not talking about in any industry, but in most of industries, because there is there used to be that mentality that all oh, people staying at home they don't work they just enjoy themselves right now you have no other choice uh, people will stay home working or not so this would be uh, i can see easily that most of the policies from for working from home will become permanent in many 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 organizations not all of them okay so these are some permanent second thing several organizations will rethink their own business. For example, I, I see another, I will jump to another question here, Alex, that Roberto Rigolon said about the entertainment industry, arts, theaters, moves, cinemas. What is happening now is that these business as they are have been massively challenged because nobody can go to the movie, to the theater. But it doesn't mean that entertainment has come to an end. So what these companies will have to do, they will have to reimagine themselves and find new ways of delivering the entertainment in a different setting, in a different setting. For example, we can see now how streaming is improving. So you need, I'm not, I don't have all the answers, but you need to reinvent your business model to see, okay, how I can do a theater 
in, in a way that people can enjoy it without going to the theater. So they, who is able to, to create a product or create a solution that people like, we win, we win. I always remember, I don't want to take this as a case, but I always remember when I was a, a teenager, I used to, to rent uh, a, a VHS tapes uh, on uh, at Bl uh, Blockbuster. You know, and it was so crazy. I used to go there and they say, oh, all copies are rented. So you cannot rent one. You need to wait them to return. And I say, imagine how do I explain this to my daughter today? So how do I explain that you need to rewind the tape at the end of the, the movie? So these today make no sense because technology helped us to find a new way. It doesn't mean that the movie industry has come to an end, but it's just a different way of doing. For example, I'm entertaining. I love to have friends. I'm entertaining myself and my family doing a uh, video conferencing. So uh, I have my glass of wine and this, and my friends on the other side at their home. Uh, it's perfect. No, but maybe this will be a way of reducing the distance. So this we need to be creative, and these will become more permanent changes in our society. Tyro, do you want to add something? I'm good, Ricardo. Thank you. Very good. So we have time for one more question. And I want to thank everybody for all the great questions that have been coming in. And this is from Sam. How should the leaders communicate with their teams? Should they be assertive and authoritative in crisis or be more supportive and inspirational and being empathetic, especially when time is of the critical essence? Uh, uh, look, uh, Sam, uh, this is a perfect question, but uh, the time now is is not, for example, I'm talking as a company leader, it's not the time to be uh, 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 exercise your authority. You know, people are weak during the crisis. And we are, again, we are on this point. We are exactly on this point today. Remember that. So people need support. People need empathy. Because it's very easy to say, oh, you need to work. Uh, the deadline must be kept the same. But then people forget that you live in a one bedroom apartment, that you live in a one bedroom apartment and that you have no other option to, to keep your kids uh, in, uh, outside your house or outside your room. So you need to be mindful of that. So for me, among these two options, there is, I have no doubt that you need to be empathetic, supportive, and you need to inspire and create. Let me tell you, it's so easy during a crisis to be pessimistic and say, the world is over, everything will fall apart, we are done. This is the easiest trap. What is not easy is to keep up your mood, your family mood, and trying to work the best you can. And this is only possible if you have empathy. Without empathy, you don't move. And I'll I add maybe Ricardo to that one. Uh, we created a document called People Manifesto where we also talk about the role of leaders, and that applies during or after or before a crisis. It applies most of, all the time. One thing that I'll say in this specific moment, as Ricardo was mentioning earlier, there are people, I mean, the leader doesn't know everything. That should be the premise that we'll be starting with, not assuming that it is one person who knows everything and then everybody is following. And during the crisis, the solution that we might need to get out of a crisis might not sit with a leader, might not sit with someone that, I mean, in a leadership role or a management role or whatever it is. It could be someone within the organization sitting somewhere that has never been called for, that would have a brilliant idea that could help the organization coming out of that crisis, so that would help the organization unleashing potential that were not there before. So going back again to the finding power to the people, listening to people, getting them involved, showing empathy, because these are not normal time. And some of these things, actually, you want to have them in normal time, that people know that you have a caring leader that is open to listening and getting the different views. Of course, at the end, the decision is made. The decision will be made. But as long as that decision is informed, and as long as people feel that they are involved and they were heard, and then the point of view were considered, then when you make that decision, people are more willing to actually helping you implementing that decision, which is one important thing as well. Thank Excellent. you. Uh, 
Yeah, Alex, I think we it's time, right? It's time we are running uh, over time, and this is my project management mindset. So I just want to thank all of you for participating. Thanks for the chance to, for us to share uh, our ideas. Again, a Brightline is a project management institute initiative, so you can find a lot of resources and a lot of things at brightline.org that will help you to guide not only at this moment, but to translate ideas into reality. And my final message is, let's be optimistic. It's not a perfect scenario, but uh, this will be over and for sure we will all be better and more prepared for the future. Thank you very much. Be safe, stay home, okay? And try to keep uh, the positive mood. Things will be better in the future soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, all. We'll be sharing a recording on the Brightline YouTube channel. Have a great day.